Yes, so Professor Ota already gave a sort of nice description of how uh, the nearly neutral theory can be applied to a bunch of different areas. And I'm going to talk about um, the sort of specific thing that I'm interested in, which is um, uh, selection on males and females and how that can differ and how the, this can be considered a form of near neutrality. Uh, I won't talk very much about the nearly neutral theory because we've heard a lot about it already, uh, but this is similar to the, the figure that Professor Ota showed, that w under selection theory you assume that most mutations are deleterious and a few are advantageous. Neutral theory, you assume that you have a large class of neutral mutations. And in nearly neutral theory, you have these nearly neutral ones where um, what happens with these mutations will depend on the population size. And although people often talk about it in terms of deleterious mutations, which is why they stick this one in between the deleterious and the neutral mutations on the figure, it could just as easily be weakly advantageous mutations where the advantage is too small for uh, this sort of thing to fix in the population unless the population size is really large. So I work on uh, something called sexual antagonism, which is all about how the fact that we have a shared genome, but two different sexes that experience conflicting, potentially conflicting selection pressures can lead to uh, maintenance of genetic variation. So we can imagine that males, they need to be a certain way and females need to be another way. And so a given allele that has the same effect in both sexes will be selected in different ways, depending on which sex it, it finds itself in. Uh, this is probably easier to explain with a concrete example, and there was a paper that was published a couple of years ago um, talking about human height as uh, potentially being sexually antagonistic. So everybody knows that height is highly heritable, the specific genes that are involved, maybe we don't know, but it's highly heritable. Um, and of course there's a, an average difference in height between men and women, such that women are shorter than men, but within a family you'll see that there are some families that are long and then both the men are ten and women tend to be long, and there are some families that are short and then everybody's short. Uh, and if you look at how this translates into fitness, the number of offspring that you have, then in men you do better if you're taller. But in women, they found, at least in the population that they studied, you did, did better if you were shorter. So that you had this sort of uh, conflicting selection pressures on uh, height genes. So you can think of this as being like a kind of genetic tug of war. So that the selection on the males, whoops, now I pressed the wrong thing. Selection on the males or on the men is pulling the population towards the male optimum, trying to fix a lot of alleles for being tall. Whereas the selection on the women is trying to pull the population towards the female optimum, so, so, so fixing alleles for being short. And if this is perfectly balanced, then these alleles would actually be completely neutral. In practice, that's probably not the case, and you'll probably have some degree of asymmetry there, which means that the net selection pressure might be directional, but very, very small. In other words, nearly neutral. So how can we look at this? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so this is something that I just made a verbal argument, but there actually is um, a, a paper by Canalan and Clark that came out a couple, a couple of years ago where they formalized this to show that this actually does lead to different predictions um, than simple balancing selection. So normally you would expect things to be maintained in the population because of, say, heterozygote advantage. And this is based on a, a classic figure from Kidwell et al. where under this weak sort of selection, this is selection on males and this is selection on females, between these two dotted lines is the region where you can expect polymorphism uh, based on balancing selection. Here they showed if you have sexual antagonism, that is, uh, different selection pressures on males and females, you can expand this region quite a lot. And then the area where a given allele will fix, then it's reduced, but everybody knew that already, so that's not so surprising. Um, Bengtola uh, also talked about the efficiency of selection and the number of selective deaths, and they also could show that the sort of efficacy of balancing selection will be dependent on the population size. So here you have the population size and the net selective effect, and that as you increase this, I mean, everybody knows that selection will be more efficient if it's stronger, so we can sort of ignore the S squared there. As we increase population size, then the y-axis, these lines, it goes up. So selection gets more efficient um, the larger the population size. But the interesting thing here is that they did some calculations and said that even for a species such as Drosophila, which has really large population sizes, you're probably more in this area when you're talking about antagonistically selected alleles, so in the 1 to 10 range, uh, which means that stuff is going to be behaving as if it's neutral most of the time, or nearly neutral. 
Okay, so now we get to the empirical part. So how can we look at this in real populations? Um, I mean, it's obviously difficult to do experiments on humans, which is why I work on fruit flies. And this is a species where you also can see uh, sexually antagonistic selection on size. So females are usually doing better if they're big because then they can lay lots of eggs. Whereas males, they don't really need to be big. They might want to be more maneuverable, so it's better for them to be small. So we have the same sort of selection uh, situation as in uh, humans that we have you know, selection pressures going in different directions on body size. It's just that in this case, the females are larger. So we can measure selection in a population, but that doesn't really tell us very much about the genetic basis. It could be that you're not seeing much of anything going on, even if you have directional selection, just because the trait is inheritable, or maybe it's you know, related to a lot of other traits by pleiotropy, and so there's not very much free variation there. So in order to actually say that this is probably due to antagonistic selection pressures, we can do experimental evolution, which is what I do, and remove selection on one of the sexes, and then see what happens. And then in this case, it's like in the tug of war, the males have let go. And so then the females could drive the population to the female optimum. So I've done a couple of experiments or a couple of um, projects where we've been looking at the importance of the X when it comes to sexually antagonistic selection. And the X chromosome is obviously interesting because it spends more time in females than in males. Fruit flies have the same sort of sex determining system as humans, with females being XX and males being XY. So a given X will spend more time in a female than in a male just because the females have more of them. Uh, apart from this, there's also some predictions about the dominance of the alleles on the X, that for a male, anything that's located on the X will be expressed anyway. And so if this is bad for females, you would want the male benefit loci to be recessive in females. Whereas for females, you would want them to be able to express this uh, with only one copy. So the female benefit stuff should be dominant. The male's gonna pay the cost no matter what. Um, so there's these predictions about dominance. So we did two experiments, two main experiments. First this one and then the, the one on the right. Uh, Sex-limited X chromosome evolution. So because Drosophila has all of these interesting genetic constructs that you can use, you can force the X to go either from father to son or from mother to daughter, uh, generation after generation, and never be expressed in the other sex. Um, you might notice that some of these flies look a little bit different, and that's because we use markers to be able to tell which individuals have which um, combination of different chromosomes. So. That means that in the, the male selected lines, we would expect the X to be, uh, yeah, enriched for male benefit alleles. And in the female limited lines, the X should start fixing for female benefit alleles. So when we looked at the male limited X chromosome evolution, then we found that the males did increase in fitness compared to the control males, but there wasn't really such a difference in the females. This does kind of make sense based on these dominance assumptions that the stuff that's bad for females might be recessive, so they might not really be paying a cost of it anyway. Um, but Professor Ota also talked quite a bit about gene regulation, so we also looked at gene expression, and then we saw some interesting patterns. We could see, for example, that metabolism and locomotory behavior were upregulated in the evolved lines, and then when we actually checked the locomotory behavior of these flies, we could see that the females had increased their locomotion behavior until they were as active as males. Uh, chromosomal damage repair seemed to be less important for the males. Then when you looked at the genes that had changed in expression and how this compared with previous data, that you could see the stuff that had increased was things that were previously known to be good for males, bad for females, and sexually antagonistic. So not just that the given allele, you had some that were good for males and different ones that were bad for females, but also that you had some that had these opposite effects and that these were overrepresented among the upregulated genes. For the downregulated genes, the stuff that was expressed less, that was the stuff that was bad for males and good for females. So it fit quite well with the, the expectation that we had uh, and confirmed that it wasn't just that there's selection on the X, but that it's not really heritable or, or can't really respond to selection. Um, another thing that we saw is that 
if you look at the sexual dimorphism in the population, so male biased on the right and female biased on the left, and then the change after the evolution in the MLX populations, you could see that um, it was almost always in the same direction, so 483 times out of 518. The change in the experimental populations was increasing the sexual dimorphism that was already there to begin with. The female limited stuff we're still currently analyzing, so I'm only going to show a little bit of it. Um, but here we see, see some interesting uh, patterns. And with the female limited X chromosome uh, evolution, then you can actually look at the, the dominance relationships more easily by giving individuals one evolved X and one control X, or two control Xs, or two evolved ones. And here we can see that the ones that have one of each they have basically the same body size as the ones that have two uh, evolved ones. And when it comes to fecundity, then it actually seems like there's some sort of non-linear pattern going on there, so that it's best to have one of each. Um, but it is definitely you know, fits with the, the expectations that we had based on the sexual dimorphism in the, in the population before, that females are bigger so that they can lay more eggs. And we saw that when we take away the selection on males, they get bigger and they lay more eggs. So that was nice. So basically, um, to, to sum up then, we can say that through this experimental manipulation, we can conclude that there is a lot of sex-specific fitness variation on the X, um, and that this uh, direction of change as a result of the selection pressures that we applied uh, it was almost always in the direction of ancestral sexual dimorphism. So they want to be more different than they currently are. Uh, and then we also have these interesting results suggesting that dominance and maybe epistasis uh, are important for X-linked loci, which is something that people have shown a lot theoretically, but there's not a ton of uh, empirical data. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jessica. Questions? Come on. Yes, minus. Okay. So do you think uh, these, uh, is there an environmental sensitivity to this as well? I mean, you know, which, which ones is optimal? Yeah, yes. Oh, well, in terms of sexual antagonism, yeah, yeah. there's definitely an environmental component that, that this can change. So if you're in a really stressful environment, then it's more a matter of just surviving. And so the differences between the sexes are not so important. Mm -hmm. So it's probably more like uh, the interactions between the sexes are uh, become quite important in a well-adapted population to mm -hmm. the local environment, but in a maladapted population, then they're not really so relevant. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Why are there so few genes on the Y chromosome? Because if this antagonism was very common, you would... One guess could be that they, some very male-specific would they get attached onto the Y chromosome because there they could be only in males. Mm. And we don't see that particularly, almost in no species. Uh, so do you have any points on that? I suppose it's maybe just because of the reduced recombination uh, or the lack of recombination with the Y so that things degenerate very quickly because there is data that suggests that X-linked loci will switch to the autosomes so that they can uh, escape some of this uh, uh, female bias selection um, so that you have more male biased or male benefit genes on the autosomes actually. Any more question? Yes, please. <coughs> so if there's uh, this trend that you just mentioned, are people looking at that in autosomes, the sex or the male or female biased um, not, mutations? Not really in humans. Um, I mean, it, there's been comparative studies in, in different types of flies and fruit flies and stuff, so that's mainly where the, the data comes from uh, at this point, as far as I know. Uh, yeah, I... I uh, Ted Morrow and um, Will Jilks and I, we published a paper on um, sex-specific effects on disease in trends in genetics last year. I advertised myself a little bit, but <laughs> anyway. Um, and, and we tried to review the evidence for sex-specific effects. And the main problem seems to be that people aren't looking for them. I mean, they're probably less common than you know concordant effects, but even still, uh, many studies don't really test for this. Hmm. 
Yeah, so uh, one way for flies to get, or any uh, sexual species to get rid of this is if, uh, if there are a gene duplication and then mm. one copy is expressed only in the males and the, the female copy is expressed in the females. So do you see, uh, are there any evidence of these things happens, happening in evolutionary time? Yeah, I think there is. I mean, uh, I can't really give any specific examples, but I do think that there's um, uh, also data from fruit flies, because they're so well studied, uh, suggesting that you will be able to... The, the uh, sex bias genes are often duplications of something else. Okay, uh, any more question to Jessica? Yes, Kiste. <coughs> is not my best yeah uh, okay but I'm very interested in in uh, uh, organisms in which uh, uh, females are the the uh, uh, heterogametic sex uh, can you can you learn anything about this by comparing with birds and lepidoptera and fish yeah I mean that's some of the the thinking is that with females being the heterogametic sex, that maybe this is why you end up with some very exaggerated uh, uh, sex differences in birds, that it has to do with the, the way the sex chromosome system is set up. Uh, and I mean, uh, the, in Uppsala, the elegant grain group, they look at this sort of thing a fair bit, and uh, Judith Mank as well, to try to see how um, selection in, in uh, birds is similar. Yeah, actually, Judith Mank did an interesting study where they looked at um, chicken breeds that have been selected for high egg production, so basically female fitness, versus ones that have been selected for some sort of yeah, fancy breeds, you know, that have weird looking feathers and things. And then they could see the pattern of changes on the, the Z and W that they were consistent with what you would expect. Last chance. No one? Okay. Then thank you again, Jessica, for this exciting talk. Thank you. Thank you.